Hi guys, it's Debbie and welcome to our yearly appointment in which we look back at all the best films of the year. Probably one of my favourite videos to make. Of course, opinions vary on which are the best titles of each year. These are just my picks and of course I would love to hear what films you enjoyed the most. So make sure to leave a comment down below with your picks. As every year, I came up with a pretty extensive list of films from which then I had to cut down all the way to five. At one point, the situation was kind of getting out of hand. But at the same time, it's literally impossible to manage to watch all films in time for the video. For example, this year, I haven't watched some films critics have been ranking very high, such as The Tragedy of Macbeth, Come On, Come On. It's just the nature of time. But I'm pretty pleased with my picks, so let's jump into my top favourite films of 2021. Opening the list is a film that, to be honest, I wasn't even particularly drawn to in the first place. Black and White, The Twenties, but which I am so pleased I eventually decided to watch, and that is Passing, starring Tessa Thompson and Ruth Negger. The term Passing refers to people who, during times of extreme racial discrimination, would um, try to pass as white. And it basically meant faking everything about your life, about your culture, let alone just your appearance. And one of the two protagonists of the film is, as a matter of fact, a woman who has been passing as white for years, she has married a white man. Nobody even knows the truth from the lengths she went to in order to conceal herself. But one day she meets an old friend who does pass as white every now and again uh, when it is convenient, but who still lives in, a whole, in her old neighborhood, who still maintains her old culture. And by hanging out together, a lot of discussion surrounding the theme of race and culture and being proud of your culture or, or hiding from it come to light. For example, in the film, the white husband is blatantly racist and the wife just has to go on with it. So there is a larger discussion about whether passing gives you new opportunities, it basically saves your life, but does it also morph you into those uh, same people and same behaviours that led you into passing in the first place? So it is a very deep and touching film, after all presented in a pretty simple manner, as most of the film is just these two women talking. But at the same time, it has a beautiful cinematography to frame it all. There are a lot of shots of the faces, the eyes, eyes that talk and reveal. There are many mirrors, men in doubles, double identity. Again, I am very pleased I decided to watch this film and I would highly recommend it. Another great film I'd like to speak about is Corda, a movie which at first glance, even just from the poster, doesn't exactly scream awards. Um, for the promotional material, I honestly thought it was just a cheesy tea movie and I didn't even read that much about it before watching it. So I went in blindly and it completely blew me away. This film is so good and it's pretty groundbreaking in the way it is made as most of the film is signed, it's in American Sign Language, with subtitles for those who don't know it. To reference one of the titles from last year's uh, Best Movies list, as Riz Ahmed's character in Sound of Metal correctly showed us, disability is something which is very common and which can happen to every single one of us at any given moment. We have to start understanding that the world is varied and disability is not something not normal. Now I'm straying a little from the main topic, but for example, Corda uh, is a film which is uh, which critics love. It's winning tons of prizes, and it's mostly acted by people uh, with disabilities who are no longer seen as the token diverse person to make this film appeal to more people because it looks more inclusive. Maybe with disabled characters portrayed by abled-bodied people, something which used to happen a lot in the past. Now, Corda, which stands for Child of Deaf Adults, is the story of a family in which everybody is deaf, except for the youngest daughter, who basically gives up a huge part of her life to help her, her parents, her family, their fishermen, and the dealing of all the prices and for any business-related fact and many daily activities, she has to be there and interpret for them, often giving up her, her own dreams. This then turns into a larger discussion about 
whether society is cutting out these people, uh, for example, the parents struggle to make friends as they don't feel included, there's not really an, any effort on behalf of their community uh, to do anything to include them and so they always have to rely on the daughter or are they also selfish for not standing up for themselves uh, just uh, sticking with the deaf community and always relying with on their daughter in, in any circumstance uh, making her uh, disregard her own dreams for example, without spoilers, in one scene the mother is annoyed that the daughter decides to, to uh, do choir at school because she won't be able to, um, to hear her and so she thinks it's a selfish decision. So there are a lot of very interesting topics, um, interesting ideas for discussion that come up in this film. It does sometimes fall into some teen cliches but I think mostly to include a wider and younger audience. And it's finally one of those films that start to show the deaf people, disabled people as regular characters. They work regular jobs, they have sex, they are shown as having a range of positive and negative characteristics. They act in sign language. I think this is one of the few films that have such an extensive part of the plot um, without spoken dialogue. So definitely recommended. And by the way, the mother in the film is portrayed by Mali Matlin, who um, is a record-breaking woman because she is um, the youngest woman ever to receive an Oscar for Best Actress and she uh, is also the, the first and I think only deaf woman to win uh, an Oscar for uh, Children of a Lesser God. Another great film on today's list is Estata la mano di Dio, translated to English as The Hand of God by Paolo Sorrentino, one of the most appreciated Italian directors. He has won many awards including uh, the Oscar for The Great Beauty, La Grande Bellezza. His new film, Estate la Mano di Dio, is semi-autobiographical as the main character basically is uh, the director during his youth in Naples. The film covers many events that actually occurred in his life. But don't worry if you don't know anything about his life, this is a fine drama movie on its own, even without knowing anything about him. So as I was mentioning, the story is set in Naples, a city uh, in Italy which Unfortunately, it's often associated with it being um, the most dangerous city in Italy. You might have seen it in other famous works like Gomorra, but it is also one of the most beautiful cities in Italy. Basically, all the south of Italy is exactly what you would imagine when you imagine that sunny postcard seaside Italy. And Sorrentino captures all this beauty as well as the passion of the Neapolitan people who are known to express their emotions very vocally, the film is nearly theatrical in certain moments, just prepare to sink into a sexy, stunning, immersive experience which also has some brutally hard moments. The plot follows this young aspiring filmmaker uh, during his youth in Naples, his family, his friends um, and Maradona, the famous footballer who plays a very important role in the plot. You definitely don't want to miss this one. Now moving from Italy to the other side of the world, next up on the list is Drive My Car, a Japanese film you will see on many of these end of year lists. Drive My Car is the story of a theatre actor and director and well basically his relationship and interactions with the people close to him, for example the actors he works with and especially his driver, a young woman with whom he develops a really interesting and deep relationship through the many journeys they have to share together. What made me really enjoy this film is this perpetual air of grace throughout the whole plot. We explore a range of emotions in the film, there's love, there's despair, there's anger, there's joy and yet th there's always this feeling of uh, a composure, especially on behalf of the protagonist, a silent elegance as if he really does fulfil this role of mysterious silent artist. Even just the opening of the film shows us how the protagonist and his wife uh, come up with all these stories just throughout the day and they narrate them to one another so as viewers we get sort of this beautiful double intertwined uh, narration but at the same time the film stays very grounded, it is very realistic and unfortunately even brutal. Nearly everybody agreed that this film does edge on the longer side of things, this is a three hour long movie, 
But at the same time, it's never too terribly dragged out. You, you definitely don't suffer throughout this film. Uh, it's quite the contrary. But now we have reached the final film on today's list and probably my favourite of the whole year, and that is Spencer, the story of the late Princess Diana. Now, Diana was a member of the British royal family who became famous for being a black sheep uh, in the family. She married into the family but just couldn't put up with basically all the stiff royal nonsense, the lack of privacy, the absurd rules, the way she was treated and she also decided to use her influence to bring attention to topics which were considered quite controversial back in the past such as the acceptance of people with HIV and AIDS. Unfortunately, over the course of years, all of this took a toll on her mental and physical health. She had some serious eating disorders. She was struggling with her mental health, all things which of course one heard of within the British royal family where everything is perfect. So she basically reached the point in which she just couldn't take it anymore. And this film, Spencer, focuses on, on this moment. It's set around Christmas in one of the royal residences when Diana is starting to reach that breaking point of just not managing to withstand the situation anymore. And it's sad and beautiful. The whole film is a mesmerizing contrast between this wonderful palace, the perfect few food, the beautiful dresses, the fancy dinners, and Diana's total loneliness and sadness. She's running down these hallways, uh, uh, crying her eyes out as she is. She's alone in her room with maids knocking on the door, telling her it's time to eat and then she won't eat, but then she'll go and stuff her face in these huge industrial kitchens in the middle of the night. The whole film just makes you want to grab her, hug her and say, it's going to be okay. Now, Diana is portrayed by Kristen Stewart, who completely blew people away. Um, a lot of people didn't even recognise her because they still associate her with the, uh, the tiny, awkward kid back from the Twilight films. But she did such a great job, I would not be surprised if an Oscar turned up here. But with that, we have reached the end of today's list. Um, and now I'm curious to hear, of course, what your picks for the year are, so make sure to leave a comment down below with the films you enjoyed the most. There will also be the video about the worst films of 2021, as every year, as soon as that will be ready, it will be linked. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.